A 23 year old has been legally euthanized after struggles with her mental health and now another young woman is next. This is Shanti DeCourt, and with both the support of her doctors and her parents, she has gone through with ending her life. She was 16 and on a school trip when she survived the Brussels airport bombing, but after that, she quote, was never the same. Now, according to Shanti's parents, she found it impossible to enjoy life after the attack, to the point where she was scared of balloons bursting and was suffering panic attacks from fireworks. This is what reportedly led them to support her decision, with everyone in her life telling her that her disease was incurable. Doctors then, quote, logically granted her request given her state of suffering, and on May 7th, the procedure was performed. And to be specific, this is reportedly a process where you're given a sedative and then a drug that stops your heart. It's actually legal in five countries across Europe, and again, now this young woman is following Shanti's lead. 28-year-old Zariah Beek is from another small town in Germany, and like Shanti, she is struggling with her mental health. In her case, she lives with her boyfriend and her two cats, but has been dealing with depression and multiple personality disorder for years. Her doctors have also told her that they have no further treatment options, to which she has said, quote, I have always been clear that if I can't get better, I won't do this anymore. She's reportedly scheduled to be euthanized next month on the couch of she and her boyfriend's home. Now, what we know is that talk of Zariah's case is leading to controversy on whether or not this should be legal. There is a review panel to determine if an applicant is eligible, and it's then reportedly their job to examine the death and declare that it was done lawfully. But one former member on that panel has said, quote, I entered the review committee in 2005, and I was there until 2014. In those years, I saw euthanasia practice evolve from death being a last resort option to being a default option. So I resigned. He went on to say that this is especially prevalent in young adults with psychological issues and that doctors are now more easily giving up on their patients. In 2023, there were hundreds euthanized in Germany, with one of them being Shanti. And while one neurologist did make complaints about the decision being made prematurely, the case was then closed after it was found that no violations were made. And as for Zariah, she's already gotten off of social media ahead of her procedure. She says that things will go something like this. Quote, the doctor really takes her time. It's not that they walk in and say, lay down, please. Most of the time, it's first a cup of coffee to settle the nerves and create a soft atmosphere. Then she asks if I am ready. I will take my place on the couch. She will once again ask if I am sure, and she will start up the procedure and wish me a good journey. Or in my case, a nice nap, because I hate if people say, safe journey. I'm not going anywhere. Suitcase killer Heather Mack has officially pleaded guilty to her mother's murder. If you know the case, you know the heiress was 18 and pregnant when she killed her mom on their vacation to Bali. She served seven years for the crime, but now she's back in Chicago facing charges that she planned it there with her boyfriend. We now know that in 2014, Heather's socialite mother had forbidden her from dating Tommy Schaefer. She reportedly even moved Heather to Gold Coast to steer her in the right direction, but that didn't stop her from getting pregnant with his child. Instead of being upset with her daughter, Sheila then came up with Bali as a way for them to reconnect and really to get through everything between them since her dad died. This included more than 80 calls to police for domestic violence between the mother and daughter. So in early August, Sheila booked two first-class seats to Bali's five-star St. Regis. The place was beautiful and things were seemingly going well, but then about 10 days in, she couldn't find Heather anywhere. When Sheila talked to the front desk, she learned that her daughter was actually still there in the hotel, staying in a second room that she was paying for under the name Tommy Schaefer. Instead of apologizing to her mother that night, Heather planned the unthinkable. The next morning on August 12th, Tommy showed up to the room with a glass fruit bowl. He bludgeoned Sheila to death with it, and she tragically asphyxiated on her own blood. From here, the couple shoved Sheila into a suitcase, put that in the back of a taxi, and tried to check out of the hotel. The thing is, they couldn't. They actually fled and left the suitcase behind, with the taxi driver taking it to the police station. With the discovery of Sheila's body, a pursuit began for the media's new Bonnie and Clyde. They were tracked down to a local hotel, and while they would paint Sheila as the bad guy, cell phone evidence led to a motive a $1.5 million trust fund. In the end, Tommy and Heather narrowly escaped the firing squad, sentenced to 18 and 10 years. The judge actually cited leniency for Heather because she was pregnant. As we know, Heather served just seven years of her sentence and has since pleaded guilty to conspiring to kill here in the U.S. She says she's already done her time and hopes to serve between zero and 15 years, with her sentencing scheduled for December. Rachel Del Tondo's former student has been named the prime suspect in her case. If you don't know, in 2018, Rachel was a suspended teacher in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. On May 13th, she went out for ice cream with a friend, not knowing someone was following her. When Rachel was dropped off at her parents around 1045, she was shot 10 times right there in the driveway. But to understand what happened there that night, we have to go back to an incident two years before. The reason her millionaire fiance broke off their engagement and she was suspended from teaching. That winter, in February of 2016, police found Rachel and a 
17 year old student here in a quote, steamed up parked car just before 2 a.m. Rachel told the responding officer that the high school football star Sheldon Jetter had just needed to talk. She said her fiance would be angry if he found out, so the officer agreed not to file a report or press any charges. About a year later in May of 2017, the police chief decided to quote, file that report in case someone got wind of it. And then suddenly in October, it was leaked to Rachel's boss and the media. All sent in an anonymous email conveniently just days after her fiance went to the station looking for more information. With that, Rachel Rachel was placed on paid suspension pending an investigation by the Department of Education. And within two months of said suspension, she got into a serious relationship with Sheldon's older brother, Bolton, the brother of the student she was seen with in that car. So, on the night Rachel was killed, we now know she actually got ice cream with Sheldon and Bolton's third brother. This seemingly did not go over well with Sheldon. You can see he texted his brother just 30 minutes before the murder, insinuating he was mad he wasn't invited. So, for the past five years, police have reportedly been building circumstantial evidence against Sheldon. They have GPS data, surveillance footage, and his history of stalking, but they cannot place her on Rachel's driveway that night. As of today, Sheldon is the only suspect in Rachel's case, and he's actually already serving life for the murder of his roommate in 2020. He shot Tyreek seven times, again, after going out for ice cream. More information has come out on the horrific attack of Adam Simji and Michaela Paulus. Last August, Adam and Michaela were enjoying a last minute road trip through Alabama before starting classes at Central Florida. They were driving through the Talladega National Forest looking for waterfalls when a young woman flagged them down on the side of the road and asked for help. As we now know, 21 year old Yasmin Hilder would tell the couple that her car was broken down an eighth of a mile away. So the students followed her to her car and tried to use jumper cables to get it started. Michaela even called her dad for advice who had years of experience as a mechanic. At this point, reportedly, out of nowhere, Yasmin pulled a gun and told the couple to quote, empty out their pockets and walk further into the woods. Adam responded by saying that everything they had was in their van and she could have it. He pulled out his own gun, at which point Yasmin asked if he was serious and opened fire. As gunfire erupted, we know Adam suffered a single fatal shot to the abdomen. Michaela could have been killed next, but somehow she managed to find her phone, call 911, use her shirt to make a tourniquet for her boyfriend's wound, and attempt to perform CPR. 30 minutes later, police finally arrived at the scene where they were confronted by a five-year-old boy with a loaded pistol. As it turns out, Yasmin and her accomplice and said son were all living off-grid in what's being described as a base camp about a half mile from the scene. Both women were arrested and thankfully the young boy dropped the weapon and was placed into state custody. This week, Yasmin pleaded guilty to second degree murder, robbery, and kidnapping and was subsequently sentenced to 35 years. Her car had actually been broken down there for months and while she did intend to rob them, she says it was never supposed to turn out the way it did. Adam is described as being there for anyone and everyone, whether it was helping someone on the side of the road or being there for the people he loved when they needed him most. The GoFundMe for his service has since been closed, but all future donations will go towards Michaela's counseling. A family of four has tragically died in a house fire, but the details of this case are really strange. Around 4 a.m. yesterday morning, a neighbor of the Krusner family woke up to see a glow coming through his window. He said he grabbed a cigarette and a coffee, and then noticed the house next door was on fire. He reportedly tried to get inside and help, but even Ferguson police had to back off several times because of the intensity. As we know, the victims here are Bertie Prusner, her 9-year-old twins Ellie and Ivy, her 6-year-old Jackson, and 2-year-old Millie. This is a Facebook post Bertie made the night before they died, reading, quote, making today one of those live each day like it's your last kind of days. Breakfast, reptile show, soccer game, and living room camp out on the agenda, plus what other shenanigans bring us joy. Happy Sunday, thank God the sun is shining. Here is a second post, quote, us against the world, I'm so blessed to be their mama. They have a heart for the Lord and have overcome so much more in their little lives than they should have had to face. And finally, there is a third post, again, all written the night before they died. This one reads, quote, all my kids peacefully sleeping in my bed curled up together, knowing they are loved so fiercely that I'd do absolutely anything for them. This is my favorite moment. So what to make of this, we don't know, but it's clear that all five of them were in the mother's bedroom when the fire happened. And that neighbors and police have found it really strange that seemingly no one in that house was waking up. Today, many people are coming forward to describe Birdie as a treasure and a wonderful teacher who loved her children and her family. Social media comments insinuate that there may have been an ongoing divorce and custody battle, but this hasn't been confirmed by police. Right now, police are describing the case as suspicious and they won't know how the fire started until further investigation. This is what we know about the awful case of 16-year-old Shelby Benny. Shelby was a cheerleader at Bixby High School, and on Thursday night, her family was on their way home with her dad behind the wheel. He had reportedly been drinking, and according to her mom, they were also having a heated argument up in the front seat. At 70 miles per hour, he tried to pass another vehicle in a no-passing zone, and their SUV flipped. As we know, Shelby was tragically ejected from her family's vehicle on impact. 
A bystander immediately ran over to the scene, but there aren't even words for what happened next. Shelby's father was reportedly standing disoriented just outside of the crashed car, and when asked if anyone was hurt, he ran away. He left his 16-year-old daughter there to die on the pavement. Now, according to police, they were able to determine that Elliot had fled to a local family-owned business, and it was there that he got access to another car. They were able to electronically track that vehicle, and within 12 hours, they found him behind the wheel in a town about an hour away. It was obviously too late to give him a DUI test, but he was taken into custody. With Elliot's arrest, we know that while he tried to tell police he skidded on an oil spot, he's also admitted to taking a few swigs of the vodka bottle that was found in the front seat. Today, Elliot is charged with first-degree manslaughter, but he has already posted his $100,000 bail. And as for Shelby's mom and her siblings, again, unfortunately, we don't know how they're doing now. Shelby is described as a bright light with a heart of gold and the best teammate you could ask for. If you would like to support her family during this time, the link will be in my bio. Two teenagers have just been seen in court for the horrific murder of Jack Snyder. Back in February, Jack was driving home from his girlfriend's birthday party when he saw two younger boys on the side of the road. It was freezing that night in Michigan, so out of kindness, he offered them a ride home. According to court documents, when 13-year-old Dewand and 14-year-old Justice entered the car, they demanded Jack pull over and remove the keys from the ignition. There was, quote, a struggle for the keys, and then Justice aimed a gun he had stolen from his mother. As we now know, Jack was fatally shot twice. The boys tragically left him to die in the street and didn't even bother taking his car. About a week later in late February, tips submitted by the community led to the arrest of 14-year-old Justice Chimney. And then the following day, 13-year-old Dewand Estes walked himself into the police station with a parent and turned himself in. With the boys appearing in court, it's apparent that both of their defenses are trying to pin the case on the other. We do know someone asked Dewand over Snapchat that night to steal a vehicle for a few hundred dollars. So today, both boys are being tried as adults in connection to Jack's murder. And the court is reportedly being asked to designate 13-year-old Dewand so in the case he is found guilty, there can be a blended sentence. And as for Jack, he never got to graduate high school or continue playing the sport that he loved. If you would like to donate to the family, the link will be in my bio. Hammer, coined the phrase, you can't make this stuff up, but have known the story of real-life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic child murderer and cannibal. Elizabeth Bristol's father may be released from prison after being ruled to no longer be a threat to society. Elizabeth went missing just after she turned 18, and her father managed to convince both her mom and the police that she had run away. The truth was that he was holding her captive in their basement, and she gave birth to seven of his children down there over the next 24 years. On August 28, 1984, Joseph lured Elizabeth downstairs under the guise of helping him carry a 3 by 2 foot door. His family thought he'd spent the past six years down there building a bomb shelter, but really, the door was the last thing he needed to seal his underground prison for Elizabeth. As she held the door frame in place for him, he shoved her inside, and he never let her back out. Up until Elizabeth was 22, she was kept in complete isolation and assaulted by her father on a daily basis. It was at this point in 1988 when she gave birth to her first two kids, Kirsten and Stefan, with just a pair of dirty scissors. She did her best to raise them underground, while her other siblings who you see here were able to go on vacations and live their normal lives. At 26, Elizabeth went on to give birth to her third child, Lisa, and she actually didn't stay downstairs. In May of 1993, Elizabeth's mom found her in a cardboard box on their front porch. With her came a note addressed from Elizabeth, explaining that this was her little girl who she just couldn't care for. Of course, Joseph was the one to place the box there, but to Elizabeth's mom, this was confirmation that she was alive and she really did run away. She took her granddaughter in and raised her with her husband, completely unaware that he was really the father. Now, about a year later, when Elizabeth would have been 27, her fourth child, Monica, showed up on the porch just like Lisa did. And then two years after that, baby Alexander showed up too. Altogether, Elizabeth had these seven children in that basement, with three of them raised upstairs thinking their mother abandoned each of them at birth, and the other three held captive in the basement with her. Tragically, the seventh child, Michael, died just after he was born, and Joseph incinerated his body. As we know, in 2008, the three kids upstairs are teenagers, and Elizabeth is 42 years old and still with the others in the basement. The youngest with her was five at this point, but her oldest, Kirsten, was 19 now, and she had never seen the sun. She became incredibly ill that spring, and for the first time ever, Joseph agreed that she seriously needed medical attention. On April 19th, Kirsten alone went to the hospital with Joseph, and he told medical staff that his missing daughter had just left her with him. She had life-threatening kidney failure, and it was clear that she had never seen a doctor in her life. The staff became suspicious, and they ultimately contacted police. 
With this report, authorities broadcasted a public appeal for the missing mother to come forward and provide Kirsten's medical history. And then, possibly in a panic, Joseph suddenly released her and the two other kids from the cellar. He told his wife that after 24 years, Elizabeth had decided to come home. After being let out, Elizabeth got Joseph to take her to the hospital, and one of the doctors tipped off police that she was there. Joseph was arrested on hospital grounds, and Elizabeth refused to say anything until she was promised that she would never have to see him again. They also gave the kids DNA tests, and they were able to confirm all six of them were Elizabeth and her father's children. In 2009, Joseph was sentenced to life, with the possibility of parole in 2024. Again, unbelievably, new psychiatric reports have just ruled that he is no longer a threat to society. And for those wondering about the kids, they quote, have new identities and are living with Elizabeth in an undisclosed location in Austria, only known as Village X. They're reportedly free and back together, but each have their own struggles adjusting to society. After five plus years, there are finally updates in the case of Carly Gousset. If you know the case, you know the 16-year-old vanished from her family's home in Chalfant Valley, California. She was last seen walking from her rural neighborhood to Highway 6, but up until now, we've really had no idea what could have happened. Today, police are searching for clues in a mining town over 100 miles away, where they quote, have seized the vehicle that may have picked Carly up from the highway. It's alleging someone is responsible for her disappearance, and to understand who, we have to go back to that Friday night. Around 7 p.m. on October 12th, Carly was untruthful to her family about attending the high school football game. She went to a hangout with her boyfriend Donald instead, and then around 8.30, became so paranoid that she blew her cover. She called her stepmom in a panic, begging to be picked up from Highland Park about 15 minutes away. Now with that, Melissa immediately left their family's home and headed to town. But by the time she arrived, her daughter had literally run a mile from the pickup spot and her boyfriend. She was found sprinting down that dark road with just her flashlight, and so she was taken home to calm down. After getting back around 10 p.m., Carly's family says that she, quote, had dinner, painted her toenails, colored, and read the Bible. But she was reportedly still acting out of it, so Melissa started taking audio recordings of her behavior to teach her a lesson the following day. Audio recordings where she clearly made some concerning statements. Now from here, Melissa's story has actually changed, but today she maintains she last saw her daughter in her bed around 5.45 a.m., and that it was around 7 when she found her missing along with her front door slightly open and a single footprint in the snow. As we know, between 7.30 and 9.30 that morning, Melissa and Carly's father were out seen searching for her in their respective vehicles. After two hours with no luck, they informed her birth mom that she was gone and then they contacted police. And police immediately found three credible witnesses who saw Carly walking that morning from Chalfant Valley Estates up to Highway 6. Now, while these sightings were in line with Carly's scent trail and the timeline provided by her parents, everyone searched and searched but found nothing. An 18-year-old has been arrested for what she took that night, along with her family for some pretty terrible domestic violence, but no leads directly associated with her case, or at least up until now. As I mentioned, police are currently searching through the town of Tonopa, Nevada, which is actually one of the first exits off Highway 6 where Carly was last seen. They've received a tip from someone there making amends in a recovery program, and reportedly this person, quote, saw an incident with her in town and can't live with knowing what happened. Police haven't revealed details about the incident, but they have, quote, been provided with the make, model, and location of the car that brought Carly into the area. Again, they've seized it, and now they're waiting on lab results. So with that, I have to add, I found one thing that might add context to this tip. About a year ago, Melissa gave an interview where she said police were following up on a lead where Carly was hit by a car out of town. Reportedly, police found a vehicle with damage to the front end and a person of interest. So if these two leads are connected, it could be an avenue where the investigation is going, following the theory Carly was picked up from the highway. Of course, she remains missing, and the most prominent theories remain that she was either abducted, wandered off, and succumbed to the elements, or never made it out of her family's house. Carly is described as being 5 foot 7, 110 pounds, with blonde brown hair and blue eyes. Anyone with information is asked to contact the number above. This 13-year-old girl survived an abduction that was nothing short of a nightmare. In eighth grade, Jamie always walked to her bus stop, and October 15th was no different. She couldn't have known that she'd caught the eye of this 21-year-old on his way to work, or that he decided right there that she would be the one he would take. Over the next few days, Jake would watch Jamie and her parents, but to him, it was never the right time. The lights were always on, or there were other people at their house, up until that Monday night. Around 1 a.m., Jake would drive back over to the closets with two pairs of gloves, his head shaved, and the safety latch removed from his trunk. Meanwhile, Jamie was up late that night when she saw a car with no headlights pull into their driveway. She immediately woke up her dad, and then she saw him for the last time go downstairs to see who it was. Now, the next thing Jamie knew, there was screaming and a single gunshot. She and her mom actually booked it downstairs and they barricaded themselves in the bathroom. They were huddled together in the tub and on the phone with the 911 operator as Jake worked to break down the door. Now, as we know, that door did eventually break and Jake came in and ripped down the shower curtain. He then reportedly tied Jamie up, pulled her next to him and horribly shot her mom in the head. From here, Jamie was dragged through her front yard put in the trunk of Jake's car. They actually drove by all of the police responding to their 911 call 
And as you can see, Jake even yielded for them to pass. And the pair obviously wasn't stopped. And when police got to the house, they walked into the confusing scene. And that same night, officials would determine that they had a double homicide and a missing girl. But there was quite literally no indication of who did this or what had happened to Jamie. And the killer had somehow left behind zero DNA and police couldn't find any prints or tire tracks whatsoever. And now with no leads, online sleuths began questioning Jamie but police always knew that she wasn't responsible. And they also reportedly did everything they could in the following months, but they had no idea that she was here. 88 days later, on January 10th, a woman walking her dog some 70 miles away saw a teenager in the middle of the road. She wasn't dressed for the snow, and before this woman could say anything to her, she said, quote, help me, I am Jamie Klaus. Now, of course, this woman knew Jamie from the news and quickly gathered that she had come running from this house next door. They ended up running together to a neighbor's further down the street, and there they all waited for Jamie to finally be rescued. The owner of this residence even guarded Jamie and the house with a gun, just in case her abductor came looking. Now that day, as police took Jamie to the hospital, they eerily passed another car in the neighborhood. It was Jake out looking for her after noticing that she'd escaped his house while he was out. This time, police pulled him over, and he told officers, quote, I did it. With Jake in custody, Jamie went on to tell her story and those three months of her life. Jake spoke too, saying that he always had bad thoughts, and again, that he never even met her. He told police he actually thought he would get caught right away, and that when he didn't, he figured he and Jamie could live a life together. He also said that he kept her under his bed for hours at a time, screamed at her, and on one occasion, hit her really hard. In the end, Jake pleaded guilty, and was sentenced to two life terms for the murders, plus an additional 40 years for the kidnapping. But, more importantly, Jamie went on to receive the Hometown Hero Award for her incredible bravery. Her parents are remembered as wonderful people, and she lives with her maternal aunt now as a true survivor. Chad Daybell is finally facing the death penalty for the murders of Tylee and JJ. If you know the case, you know the siblings were last seen in Idaho in September of 2019. The thing is, no one knew they were missing for nearly three months. Their mom, Lori, has since been convicted of their murder, and today her fifth husband, Chad, is on trial. Now, going back to February of that year, we know that Lori's fourth husband, Charles, filed for a divorce. She had become obsessed with Chad Daybell's doomsday books, and with that, started acting really strange. She became romantically involved with the author that spring, and genuinely thought they were the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, as we know, Charles then tried to tell police that he was scared for he and the kids' safety, but by midsummer, he was dead. On July 11th, so about two months before the kids went missing, he went by Lori's new place in Chandler to pick up JJ for school. As soon as he got there, he was shot to death by her brother, or the kid's uncle Alex. Unbelievably, it was initially ruled to be in self-defense. This is actually a photo of Lori just after her husband was shot, and this is a screenshot of the message she sent, breaking the news to his sons from a previous marriage. Now, following Charles's death, we know that Lori moved herself, the kids, and uncle Alex to Idaho to be closer to Chad Daybell. Again, the kids were publicly last seen there that September, but no one knew they were missing. No one knew that the couple had determined them to be zombies or that they were buried in Chad's backyard. Now, with the kids unknowingly gone, October came, and Chad's wife, Tammy, suddenly died in her sleep. It reportedly appeared to be natural, and therefore, he and their five kids decided not to perform an autopsy. Tammy was buried with no one knowing that she was actually asphyxiated, and then Chad and Lori fled off to Hawaii together. They got married on November 6th, and it was three weeks after that when JJ's grandparents realized no one had seen the kids. Now again, as we know, in February of 2020, Lori was finally arrested for failing to produce her children. And then, after another four months, police finally ascended on Chad's property and discovered human remains. They reportedly first found JJ, who was buried with a plastic covering over his head and still wearing his pajamas. Then they found Tylee, who was dismembered and burned to the point that investigators didn't think it could be a body. It was reportedly clear that Chad, Lori, and Uncle Alex were all involved. Now from here, Chad and Lori were obviously charged with murder, and more came to light about why they did this. It naturally doesn't make sense, but they reportedly believed that they were chosen to save the world, and that they had to kill these kids because they had evil spirits. Of course, on the other side, there's the belief that it was all just a scheme to be together and obtain benefits from life insurance. In May of 2023, Lori Bala was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Again, now Chad is on trial, and it's supposed to go on for the next nine weeks. If Uncle Alex were still here, I'm sure he would have a trial too, but he has also since suspiciously died. It is actually kind of crazy just how many deaths Lori Bala was linked to. There's Tylee, JJ, Charles, Tammy, and Alex, but then there's also Joseph and Stacy. Future charges are expected, and I will keep you guys updated with the trial. Trial has officially begun for the murder of mom of five, Jennifer Dulos. If you've been following, you know Jennifer vanished from her Connecticut home in the midst of a years-long custody battle with her husband. She was last seen dropping her kids off at school on January 24th, but then she didn't show for her 11 a.m. doctor's appointment. Jennifer's friends ultimately reported her missing that night, with police arriving at the scene to find the floors and walls of her garage covered in blood. Now from here, police obviously caught up on the fact that Jennifer's husband was having an affair, and she was renting this house to get both she and her kids away from his abuse. 
They decided to obtain surveillance footage from the neighborhood, and that is when they saw something chilling. Someone had showed up to Jennifer's house on a bike that morning, and he was waiting to kill her in the garage when she got back from dropping her kids at school. As we know, over two hours later, Jennifer's car left the house again, but please don't think she was the one driving. They tracked her vehicle down to find it abandoned in a local park, and after checking surveillance there, they also found what appeared to be a getaway truck. The thought is that it was previously driven there to transport Jennifer's body, and with everything considered, police began tracking her husband and his girlfriend's movements. As police would learn that same night, Fotis and Michelle were seen in the getaway truck dumping black trash bags into 30 separate dumpsters. Authorities immediately went to these locations and they found bloody clothing, zip ties, and cleaning supplies that all had Jennifer's DNA. With that, on June 1st, Fotis and Michelle were officially charged with tampering with evidence. Without a body, there just wasn't enough for a murder charge and they both posted bail. As investigators continued to build their case in 2019, they executed search warrants at the property where Jennifer previously lived with Fotis and the kids. There, they first found what they have come to call alibi scripts. Two scripted documents written by Fotis and Michelle that detailed what they would tell police they did on the day Jennifer disappeared. They also found proof that the couple had paid in cash to have the getaway car professionally cleaned. There was still no body though, so in September, they were again both charged with tampering with evidence and both posted bail. From here, things were actually quiet for a few months, but come January of 2020, the couple was finally charged with Jennifer's murder. I can't begin to understand why this was an option, but for the third time, they posted bail. Fotis was due to show up in court on January 28th, but he didn't, and police found him unresponsive at his house. He had poisoned himself with carbon monoxide and ultimately passed away on January 30th, 2020. That leaves Michelle and actually one of Fotis' friends to face charges in this case. Today, Michelle stands trial for conspiracy to commit murder, and while her story has changed a million times, she maintains she has no idea what happened to Jennifer or where she could be. Jennifer, of course, remains missing, and a judge actually declared her deceased earlier this week. I will keep you guys updated, but may this hopefully lead to some answers or justice in this case. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders, gradually progressed in violence, beginning with drive-by shootings and culminating in acts of cannibalism.